Hallo liebe Leute und herzlich willkommen bei Nerdfallmedizin. Diesmal eine ganz spezielle Folge, denn ich habe Jula bei mir und ihr werdet gleich sehen, warum es eine spezielle Folge ist, denn wir wechseln gleich ins Englische. Ich habe mir nämlich gleich einen internationalen Spezialisten gekrallt und ähm, äh, bin gespannt mit ihm zum Thema Intubationskiller. Was das alles bedeutet, werdet ihr gleich hören, ähm, sprechen. Und jetzt wechseln wir aufs Englische. Jula, I'm really honored that you are here. Thanks for coming on to Nerdfall Medizin. Thank you very much, Martin. I'm also really glad to be here. I already told the German listening crowd a few uh, words about what we're going to talk about. It's called Intubation Killers. Sounds um, interesting and, and uh, yeah, a bit scary. But uh, before we go into the details, can you say a few words about you, what you're doing and um, uh, tell Absolutely. everybody? Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, my name is Jula Tövishazi. I'm from uh, Budapest, Hungary. I work uh, partly as a pediatric anesthetist uh, in a university clinic. And the other part of my job is um, uh, I'm a medical director of a pre-hospital uh, specialized pediatric uh, um, care team uh, called St. Martin uh, Pediatric Pre-Hospital Service. That's um, an ambulance uh, service which works together with the National Ambulance Service in Hungary and is specialized uh, in the care of uh, sick babies and, uh, and children. Uh, so we, uh, and there's another thing which makes uh, this happen is that uh, our service is this year, it's uh, 25 years old. So we have a, an anniversary and that's why we are starting to or trying to build some international relationships so i very i'm very happy that uh, that martin accepted um my uh, my tip to to do a, a joint webinar yeah thanks so much it's 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 great to hear um, about your experiences and especially since you're in such a as you said specialized um system you know what what's interesting to me is um do you do uh, transfers like um, from a small hospital a, a, a sick child or baby um, or do you also do like pre-hospital um, acute work um, there's an uh, injured um, small child or um, yeah. um, um, birth outside of hospital yes actually we do both uh, yeah. about about uh, two-thirds of our work is really pre-hospital like in a normal um, pre-hospital team And the other, about one third of our, our cases are uh, uh, inter-hospital retrievals, which also include uh, such cases where we have to do some uh, stabilization, for example, in a, in a smaller uh, rural hospital. And then after stabilization, we transfer the, the, the child to a, to a bigger center, to a pediatric intensive care unit. Um, but we also do normal, uh, like for uh, transfer for diagnostic or, or procedures or or uh, or operations in specialized centers. So, so we do both of them. Yeah. Oh, sounds sounds really challenging and a broad yeah, a broad spectrum. <laughs> it is. Yeah, that's that's right. That's right. And also, our our we have a quite wide uh, wide team of. Uh, of experienced doctors who who are mainly pediatric anesthetists, intensivists, neonatologists, but obviously they also have to be very, very good, well trained in pre-hospital uh, work because obviously that's a quite another, uh, quite different uh, job. So it's it's really a challenge to be prepared to do also pre-hospital and, uh, and retrieval work. And, uh, And very important is that our team has very experienced paramedics and uh, and drivers who who are also a very great help of our team because they tend to have this as a main job. So that mean which means they do it every day. They are very experienced with children, very uh, well trained, and very uh, and have have a, a quite long experience with pre-hospital service having a background on spent on years spent on so to say adult ambulance uh, cars as well that sounds 
that sounds really amazing and i i can imagine that it's it's a harsh transition for somebody who works in a neonatal icu yeah it basically is to be on the street uh in the rain <laughs> so that's it that's is it is but uh but it's a nice challenge as you said yeah i can imagine yeah, i'm always happy um i work as a just regular um pre-hospital doctor and if uh, in the rare cases that we have babies or really small children or or a pre-hospital birth um we usually have um one uh, baby baby ambulance with a pediatrician a specialist and a specially trained paramedic team um if they're available <laughs> but yeah. i'm i'm really happy if if i need them and they come i I'm, i'm relieved <laughs> they help out yeah. a lot <laughs> I understand. Actually, that's the same same situation for us with adults because we 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 are not really happy if we in the few cases we get adult cases, but obviously we have to manage if if it's needed, but not not our normal environment. <laughs> smaller needles, smaller tubes, and everything. That's right. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, we we talked before and and uh, thought about a cool topic and I really liked the uh, I liked your idea about uh, speaking about um, critical situations uh, surrounding the topic intubation. We called it intubation killers and we thought about four different scenarios um, uh, that could be really killers if we just start into the intubation like we do it with a stable. Um, patient that hasn't eaten and uh, has a good blood pressure and everything is fine yeah. under yeah. bright lights in the hospital. So um, what is your first worst or bad case scenario? The first one for me is uh, is a condition which can affect not only children but adults as well. So it's I think it's a good place to start is, uh, is severe uh, acidosis because uh, people with uh, severe metabolic acidosis tend to have a, a very effective respiratory compensation. Let's just think about patients with the DKAs, so diabetic ketoacidosis. They tend to have a very severe uh, acid load, a very severe metabolic acidosis, and uh, a very high minute volume uh, compensating this and maintaining a quite normal pH. And uh, one uh, very dangerous situation is where you have this patient with a very high minute ventilation and you suddenly, uh, as part of an RSI, RSI process, you suddenly take away their uh, minute ventilation, reduce their, uh, reduce their um, respiratory rate or their tidal volume, and suddenly there can be a very uh, dangerous drop in pH, which can also lead to a cardiac arrest or, or hypotension. So that's why we also call it an intubation killer. So um, what I what I think is a good advice in this, these cases is partly that uh, during uh, uh, patient care, um, like in DK or other causes of severe metabolic acidosis, like toxicology um, and other, other sepsis and so on, um, renal insufficiency, you really have to take this consideration into account. And also uh, there are a few cases where you actually have to postpone intubation or actually even uh, omit it um, because uh, uh, this is a very dangerous one and you better prepare for a very, very, uh, um, uh, very very safe induction in these cases what i can uh, give as an advice that if you if you really need to intubate for example dk patients like let's take a, a patient with a deteriorating um, level of consciousness or a, or some special situation like an acute abdomen needing surgery and so on that you really have to during pre-oxygenation phase, you really have to maintain this high minute ventilation. So actually, basically, you have to hyperventilate the patient. And also after intubation, you also really have to rely not only on the ETCO2 uh, uh, level, so the car uh, exhaled carbon dioxide, but also take when it's when there's an opportunity for you, uh, you should take regular blood gas analysis uh, um samples so that you can set the the so you can maintain the 
pre-intubation uh, CO2 level. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what um, that's what my uh, possibility. Would you would you consider using um, like non-invasive ventilation before, even if they ha have uh, good oxygenation? Um, so uh, maybe just to gauge how, how much are they breathing because if they accept uh, non-invasive you see okay they have a respiratory rate of 40 they have uh, this and this minute ventilation yes to just then switch uh, nicely right. over to the that's, ventilator absolutely that's a very <clears throat> that's a very good point um which i think you also going to mention in other <laughs> other parts <laughs> as well but uh, a non-invasive device either with the professional non-invasive ventilator or with the ventilator you are going to ventilate the patient after intubation like in uh, pre-hospital care it's a very good uh, thing to not only to do a passive pre-oxygenation or like an apneic pre-oxygenation but uh, a very active one with uh, with a uh, with a high minute ventilation settings so that's a good good idea do you have any so tips for the people working in pre-hospital care that don't have um, blood gas analysis and um, um, uh, don't have the possibility to see the, the low pH, um, apart from DKA, where you say, okay, the blood sugar is high, so let's think it could be a DKA, maybe not intubate. Is, is there, are there any other cases or any signs where you would say, Think about if you really want to do an intubation out in the field. Yeah, I think there's always always a cause. So there's always something you should suspect, like uh, DKA toxicology. In in toxicology, maybe one typical case is um, aspirin overdose or, or other uh, drug intoxications. Uh, also, people. Uh, uh, with uh, with uh, re acute renal disease can have also metabolic acidosis, um, so there should be a, um, a background cause which you are not always aware of, uh, obviously in the pre-hospital field. But there should be some suspicion, and also if you notice a patient with uh, with high minute ventilation, it can be a cause or can be a good sign that maybe this patient is doing this as part of a compensation process against acidosis so maybe these these signs can help as well do you have um, the opportunity in your pre-hospital um, setting to do a um, mobile blood gas yes it's it's not all not on every uh unit obviously but uh but uh our specialized units does have a pre-hospital blood gas analyzer device. There are many, many technical uh, problems which can come up, so it's not a hundred percent available uh, thing. But we we do it quite uh, more and more, so qu quite often, quite uh, quite frequently. Yeah, mm -hmm. you obviously you have to find the place uh, for it in the management because you are not. It's Obviously, it's not the same as a professional um, in-hospital blood gas analyzer, but there are some certain situations like in toxicology, like in uh, patients who have uh, uh, long seizures, status epilepticus, it can give some hints, not only on acid-based disorders, but also in electrolyte imbalances. Uh, so that can be quite a big help, yeah. That's um, we recently just from donations basically got um, blood gas analysis on our pre-hospital mm -hmm. um, um, physician-based units. Yeah, um, and as you said, it's sometimes it's um, it's a bit fiddly to work with um, the mobile systems. Either it's a it's a drop too much blood, or it's a little bit too less, and it takes a minute. And it, so it's it's not like push it in like like in the hospital Absolutely. but but yeah. sometimes as you said it's 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 fantastic in 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 CPR for instance or um and then see if the if the potassium is super high or or like you said in renal failure sometimes it's really nice to see that um there's a big problem and you maybe divert to a bigger hospital that has 24/7 dialysis um before put, putting them to a smaller hospital and then have to, having to transfer them an hour later yeah yes, okay I agree. all right so so acidosis is something I'm really scared about. 
uh, in mm. people that need intubation because, as you said, it's um, it's really a killer um, because if the pH drops a bit more, they go into arrest and then and then it's hard to get them back from arrest. That's right. That's right. What would you say about people saying, okay, um, I mean, they're acidotic, um, give them bicarb. Just if you yeah. think they have a high respiratory rate, just throw in an, a mm -hmm. bit of bicarb. Um, this makes the acidosis better, right? Yeah, actually, it's uh, it, it theoretically it can make sense. Specifically in DKA, it's really not advised to get, give bicarb apart from extreme situations. You know, with pH is from six point eight or six point nine. Uh, so generally, I would say no. But uh, there are some situations where it can make sense as a as a part of a preparation for intubation, maybe to make uh, to temporize things for a bit, maybe to make uh, things easier for the for this uh, uh, period of time. But you always have to uh, remember that if you give bicarb, there is some CO2 to um, extra CO2 to uh, ventilate, so. At the same time of giving bicarb, you also have to maintain this high minute ventilation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a really good point because um, thinking it magically changes the pH. Um, yeah, it's not the case because you get need to get it out, and if they are already on the highest limit of trying to get it out, yes, that's it's right. Not changing too much, so that's a that's a good point. Yeah, that's right. Okay, Martin, how about uh, how about another? intubation killer What's yeah your... so, so i chose the the easier ones <laughs> the not so complicated ones but still um it's something that's that's not it it's it's quite often really a killer as you said um so my first um situation is just simply hypoxia Hypo we, we of, often see hypoxic patients because if they decrease consciousness and um, they breathe a little worse or have um airway obstruction and so um, a respiratory um, a function goes down and uh, they the people get hypoxic. And intubating somebody that already is hypoxic is, is a killer because you always or nearly always have a period of less ventilation, less oxygenation, even if you pre-oxygenate, okay, um, it's, it's, um, it's hard to maintain the exact level and and people are gonna drop faster as they are lower in the spo2 so so somebody who is starting with 99 percent has a has a less steep curve and somebody who's starting at 91 the drop is faster and and more more dramatic especially i would imagine um uh, in children who have uh, really a lower tolerance or or on the totally other side the um bariatric patients the big ones um also have a very low um uh, tolerance for for hypoxia so what can we do we don't we do resuscitate before intubate that's probably for for all um the points we're gonna we'll talk about today but but we need to optimize oxygenation and very few patients actually need the tube right away i mean of course there is the 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 airway that's closing after a bee sting or something like that but that's super rare or somebody who is vomiting so much that they are aspirating all the time yeah. um despite suction but many of the patients like say um um, uh, cerebral problems or any uh, uh, trauma they don't need a tube uh, within five seconds maybe they need a tube but we have usually have a bit of time and if we use this time we can optimize the situations and go go easier so it's just what everybody knows we need to do a good pre-oxygenation at least high flow oxygen um, passive high volume uh, let it let it go if we have two two oxygen sources which is easy in hospital sometimes a bit um, logistically complicated pre hospitally it's nice to have nasal prongs also on the highest flow possible um, 15 liters or more what 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 is possible um, if we have uh, um, like um, a special high flow nasal cannula, which is pre hospitally nearly nowhere available, I would imagine. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's also nice because we have much higher flow, um, and there's also a new paper um, that came out a few weeks ago, um, uh, the pre oxy uh, trial that says um, why don't you use um, 
uh, non-invasive ventilation for pre-oxygenation because you give more PEEP, you give more FiO2, so optimize um, the whole situation. And then we need to be fast, especially in those that don't have a lot of um, uh, uh, compensation in children, in bariatric patients, basically in every emergency patient. It would be nice if we would be fast. So let's take a video laryn laryngoscope. Let's have a checklist. Let's go through everything before and then like a Formula One uh, a team, be quick and be, uh, be um, efficient. Um, I just want to mention uh, the the trick uh, used in the preoxy trial and 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 in a few few other uh, um, specialized teams, I think that's gonna be more broadly used in the future. Because if you start with non-invasive ventilation, why don't you use the mask that's now fitted that works as basically your ba your bag? You don't you don't need your hand. You can use the machine, so you don't overventilate. You don't. Uh, um, uh, Put air into the stomach because you, because of your stress, you press the um, the the back too much. Even in children, I can imagine um, with a with pressure, not volume, um, you can you can give adequate um, um, ventilation. And then you just switch from non-invasive to back back mask back mask with a ventilator, and then yes. just uh, change the yes. settings to which, invasive. Which also means technically a great help because this means that the the ventilator system is already assembled, so you don't have to uh, remember. Oh, I forgot to um, assemble the uh, or check the uh, the ventilator because it's already there and you are already already using it. Yes, it totally makes sense. I think totally. And I mean, you're an anesthesiologist, so. Um... Uh, for you, it's basically mu muscle memory to to make a good ba um, mask ventilation. But for me, who doesn't do it every day ten times for um, you know um, <laughs> a, 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 a many years, um, it's it's much easier from the cognitive standpoint just to hold the mask double C or Absolutely. somehow just keep it tight and everything else. You know, the ventilation is done by a machine, and I just need to say, you know, let's switch to this setting, let's switch to this. So I can have a have a broader view of the team and can don't have too much to do. <laughs> can Absolutely. Think a bit, um, of, Absolutely. Of, I agree. Uh, so if you have this technology there, why don't you use it and why don't you really set it in, in an optimal way? Yeah. And then you have, as you said, you have both of your hands, which which is a very great help to do a, a two-handed mask ventilation. Yeah, that's... I, and and last thing um, depends, of course, on the ventilator. But um, um, if you have a, a nice ventilator that has the, um, uh, either a backup frequency on non-invasive ventilation or or a backup um, uh, ventilation mode, which is a bit harder, um, you can set this frequency a little bit lower than the patient's normal frequency. Let's say they have a 15 uh, respiratory rate of 15. You put the non-invasive on. You see it's 15, and then you increase the, the backup frequency to like 12, 11, yeah. 13, uh, two or three breaths below. And as soon as the anesthetic works, as soon as the relaxation works, you have uh, the machine magically takes over. So it's um, it's you don't even have to switch settings, which is just fantastic. Yes, that's, that's a very good point. Yeah. So that's that's the thing about um, hypoxia. We need to be pre prepared, and of course, in in um, some situations, um, it's nice to have um, um, have nasal prongs on all the time as a um, um, apnea um, oxygenation. I think the data on the nasal prongs is not that great. It's a nice tool, but it's it's not that great. Uh, it's great on high. Um, um, uh, high flow uh, nasal cannula there i think it's it's clear if you have this available but then it's always a bit of a hassle to to change from ventilator and settings and yes. systems but and also there's some a bit of practical issue with the uh, the nasal prongs um giving some extra volume there which can make the mask ventilation a bit difficult or or cause some leak uh, yeah. around the, the mask yeah that's you, you're totally right. I think that you can only manage it or nearly only if you have a in a bigger person, not in a small child, probably, yeah. but have, have double C. Um, that's right. Um, uh, that's right. Um, yeah. Cold. So that's that was my take on hypoxia.
Okay. Uh, resuscitate before intubate. And now I'm really interested what your next killer is. Actually, it's a very specific disease or a very quite a rare disease, which um, maybe many of our uh, listeners don't really encounter in their lives. But uh, still, uh, still, as I've come ac came across it a f quite a few times, I really wanted to mention is a situation uh, called uh, mediastinal mass and uh, specifically an anterior mediastinal tumor or mass can cause such a problem uh, which is also a very which also can be an intubation killer obviously it's not an everyday thing but um, in uh, for example in uh, pediatric hemato oncology or also uh, young adults it's uh, uh, there can be cases where there's a slowly go growing tumor uh, most frequently um, uh, hematological disease like uh, uh, lymphoma, which is very slowly but very steadily growing um, uh, in the in the chest cavity, thoracic cavity in the the mediastinum, and uh, and it can lead to um, a gradual uh, compression of the airways, and not only the airways but also the the heart and the great vessels. And there are some situations where this um, is this illness is is not uh, not known yet, so it's under maybe under diagnostics. There can be situations where these children or adults uh, can breathe spontaneously quite well, or maybe they take a specific position, like they just can breathe in a sitting position. They are sleeping in a sitting position for a few days. And uh, but it's it's a maintainable um, spontaneous breathing, and by the time for you for some reason uh, uh, suddenly switch from a spontaneously so negative pressure breathing with anesthetics with muscular relaxants to a intubation and a positive pressure breathing, this can lead to very uh, very dangerous and actually deadly consequences. Um, so. What my advice would be if maybe someone encounters such a situation or have have um, experienced this uh, previously is that uh, these patients, uh, the most optimal thing is to, to delay intubation. So if there is, is a small possibility to manage them um, with non-invasive support, with, uh, with uh, spontaneous ventilation, with, uh, with uh, additional... Um, oxygen then you should do that because and intubation should only uh, take be taking place in a very specialized center where there is a surgical maybe ECMO maybe a very special um, uh, intensive care capability and uh, and there are also cases where uh, uh, for example in lymphoma there can be cases where the treatment, the start of the treatment uh, of this process uh, can come forward and can give uh, quite, a, quite a big uh, improvement in this. Uh, so may, may shrink this uh, tumor size so that uh, maybe intubation is, avo is avoidable. So I know it's a quite a rare disease and a very specific condition, but I, I really wanted to mention it because there's, there's a very, very high risk if you decide just routinely to, to intubate this uh, patient for, for transport reasons or for other uh, uh, causes. Yeah. And as, as far as I understood, and I'm luck, luckily never encountered this before, to be honest, at least not in my personal experience, um, um, having to intubate or thinking about intubating somebody like that. Um, the problem is not only the compression of airways, which is one thing, but as you said, the compression of the larger vessels, changing of pressure. Um, so you're not only getting a respiratory or AB problem uh, with um, RSI, but also a, a hemodynamic problem because you're changing pressures and so on. It's Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's the case because uh, if you're forced to lie down, if you force this patient to lie down from their normal position, like sitting or 
or anything like that or turning on their side you force them to to occupy a supine position with a normal lying condition this can also lead to something like vena cava superior syndrome uh, with venous obstruction but also um, also these patients maybe can have uh, simultaneously some uh, pleural or pericardial effusions as well so that's also a dangerous situation, not only from the respiratory point of view, but also uh, circulation is affected. So that's a good point. So for everybody um, that's listening and that says, oh, oh my God, I can't, can never intubate a patient because he could have that and then everything is going downhill. Um, luckily, luckily, as you said, it's not that common, but, but are there any signs if it's not... Um, so if the condition is not yet known, that might point you in that direction? Or yeah. should it be like a patient with lymphoma that, that gets worse and you think, okay, I hear lymphoma, I, I see that get worse. That's um... Yeah, so I think partly if you know that this patient can have um, some hematological issue, uh, which involves the thoracic cavity, you always have to think about this opportunity. Also, Obviously not in the pre-hospital area, but in a hospital, a chest x-ray is a very quick tool or even an ultrasound is a very quick tool which with which you can rule out some great big uh, tumor or some great big pleur pleural or pericardial effusion. And also patients who have a difficulty of breathing, but uh, a gradually increasing work of breathing and also some additional uh, sounds like stridor or uh, in or expiratory uh, wheezing or problems or patients who who take a specific um, position to breathe um, these can be maybe red flags where you can uh, um, where you can think about Maybe it's not the best patient to intubate right now, but needs some additional diagnostics in a, in a hospital, in a specialized center and so on. But obviously, as you are right, so it's not 100% uh, um, clear in all cases. So uh, maybe it, it can, we can only uh, anticipate it, but not, only, not always 100% uh, diagnose it, obviously. Okay. It's it's a it's a really great point, and um, I haven't had this uh, really present on my um, uh, thinking before uh, intubation. But it's it, I think it, it helped me a lot. So if okay. I if I ever have to do this do this in ten years uh, time, I'll I'll think about you and say you know, all right, maybe <laughs> he, he saved that one guy. Um, that that's that's nice. Okay. Uh... This was a quite rare disease, but there is a very common condition uh, which can also lead to intubation uh, complications and the intubation killer. What's that, Martin? Yeah, as as mentioned before, I'm I'm here for the easy and common stuff. <laughs> you you get the complicated uh, things. Um, it's uh, it's hypotension, and everybody agrees. Of of course, if we have a patient that has a a blood pressure of 70 over 40, it might not be a good idea to, to intubate them right away. Um, but sometimes the dynamic of the situations, like let's say it's a, it's a serious trauma, um, a vehicle accident, something like that, uh, people with um, um, probably internal bleeding, something that, that gives the situation a lot of dynamic, um, you think you need to intubate them right away because it's they need a tube anyway, and uh, so let's do it um, uh, in the field. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't intubate um, unstable patients because sometimes it's uh, important and sometimes it's needed also for transport reasons. For instance, if I put them in a helicopter, I have very little access, and in in cabin intubation is not a is not a fun thing. But um, but I again I just have to repeat: uh, resuscitate before intubate. In, in the profusely bleeding patient, it's hard, especially if you can't stop the bleed. Um, um, but but even then, we can maybe try to at least have um, uh, push those pressers ready um, or um, elevate the bl 
blood pressure a little bit and and as it goes uh, in the other other conditions um people with sepsis or or some other problems where we can directly counter the problem for instance with no epinephrine or something like that um we should really take the time to optimize the situation before we go the intubation route and as you said maybe um temporize it with non-invasive ventilation with high flow oxygen something like that and try to optimize make it as 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 nice as possible going into this uh into this worst case situation yeah um as, i absolutely yeah. agree and this is actually it's the same condition in children as well and and there are also situations and i would like to ask you this question where you know this patient has a shock you know this patient has hypotension but you are you have absolutely no clue which type of shock that is and which is the the cause do you do you have the opportunity to use ultrasound uh, pre hospitally for such cases luckily luckily we do so our our helicopters uh, our helicopter system um uh, has has ultrasound on every on every machine and also in in my local um service we have um ultrasounds on our physician based units which is really nice in exactly that case you know is it is it a um tamponade or is it uh, internal bleeding or is it just a very badly pumping heart which would be the typical situation for the the older yeah. patient um that has this problem um so I, i totally agree ultrasound is 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 a really big helper um in the hospital of course in yeah. um resource room uh helps us a lot of also pre hospitally and um and one case that i really want to mention is the the ones that don't have a low blood pressure because if we see a 70 uh, blood pressure at 70 or 40 everybody says you know it's it's, it's shock but but there are those patients especially cardiogenic shock that have that that maintain a blood pressure like 140 150 but they they look shocked they are uh, peripherally they are cold um they are um uh, sweaty you know you know those patients and if you take uh, their sympathetic drive um their pain their fear it's good <laughs> But you need to be prepared that the blood pressure is going to tank, um, even if you're starting with no, really normal blood pressures or looking like the blood pressure is is, is still normal that we measure. Um, those are the patients that I really, really like to prepare. In hospital, um, of course, try to get an um, invasive blood pressure monitoring, get, a, get an arterial line and see how the blood pressure goes, have an infusion pump ready with no epinephrine running already, even if the blood pressure is is normal at the time of induction. Um, in, in the pre-hospital setting, I don't know if how, how it is with your setting, um, infusion pumps, or in German we call them uh, perfusor, um, it's, uh, it's not that common. So the pre-hospital teams, it sometimes the handling is not, um, not as routine as on the ICU. So it sometimes takes a lot of time and it's, 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 it complicates and uh, the situation. So we use, uh, push those pressers very, very often in the pre-hospital setting. I don't know how you would, uh, do that. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. We, we are not really, um, familiar with, with, uh, I mean, We we also use push dose pressors, uh, not really on the everyday basis. So we are probably more used to setting up an infusion pump, starting a nor noradrenaline or adrenaline infusion running earlier. But absolutely, definitely, a push dose presser is also an opportunity. Uh, you have to know the the dose and the the volume and the dilution, but that's absolutely a good good thing to do, and a good thing to prepare. And also, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the shocked patient with normal blood pressure because that's also in pediatric care. It's a very important learning point that you shouldn't wait wait until there is hypotension because children have a very uh, very effective compensation, so they can maintain blood pressure really up to up till death so you you really have to rely not only on your blood pressure which is also important but also on the other signs you mentioned uh, the bad peripheral perfusion the shock signs and so on that's yeah that's that's my worst case situation the the shocked child that needs uh, some airway protection 
Um, this is something that I I try to avoid. <laughs> yeah. If it's if it's there, let's uh, let's deal with it. But um, that's um, it's great that uh, there are people like you and your your system or my colleagues that come and um, save me in in these situations. All right, um, let's let's summarize. Basically, we said. Um, the, the easy stuff, hypotension, hypoxia, we need to resuscitate before intubate as much as possible, get oxygen ready, get uh, get PEEP uh, flowing, um, get um, uh, push those pressers or, um, or effusion pumps running, um, find out what the cause of the shock um, could be um, to treat it more specifically. And with acidosis, um, you need to think about it. Um, you need um, uh, to maybe think about not um, not doing an intubation, omitting the intubation, um, using other ways like non-invasive ventilation. And if you have to intubate, if there's no other way, um, you need to be prepared and try to match the high minute ventilation, maybe non-invasive and then uh, invasive ventilation. Uh, but it's a really high risk situation, as you said. And sadly, bicarb is not uh, uh, not the easy tool that you put in it that's easy. And at the end, and that's that's my biggest learning point. Um, think about people with that's that's rare, but can be can be there, and it's a worst case situation with mediastinal mass that um, not only makes us a breathing problem, but also a hemodynamic problem. Um, don't change the, the the way they they sit and they they do, and maybe go to people who have more expertise and more equi equipment. Uh, if you really think they need to be intubated. Yes, I think it was a very, very good summary, Martin. So thank you. Maybe this uh, small podcast helps a bit in, in, in such situations. So uh, I was glad because this is not only true for uh, adults or children, but, but really um, these conditions can occur, can occur in every age group. So the principles are the same. The the trip, three tips and tricks are maybe the same. So we just have to use them. I'm really honored um, that you uh, spent your time uh, with me this uh, this morning. Um, thanks for all the great insights and thanks for the idea to to set up something like this. Um, I'm I'm really happy that you you contacted uh, me and um, I'm looking forward to maybe meeting you at one of the conferences uh, in real Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Um, Thank you very much. Martin. And all congratulations for 25 years of your service. So that's uh, really uh, fantastic. All right. Thank you very much, Martin. That's That was really a pleasure also for me. And... Um, and I'm absolutely looking forward to meeting in person and also to 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 maybe some uh, some other occasions we can also do something uh, like this again. I would love it. Thanks so much, and I hope to see you here or on Nerd for Medicine, and talk to you soon. Bye bye. All right.